the evening and we love talking about hot topics in women's health. We've got with us Dr. Mahita Reddy. She's a leading OBGYN. She works for the Apollo Cradle. I think we all know the Apollo brand. And she works in Jubilee Hills, which is I a fabulous area, if I remember correctly. But uh, we are very excited also to partner with the KPR Institute of Engineering and Technology, which is an autonomous engineering and among the top engineering institutions in the Coimbatore region. And they're joining us, and we have a lot of their students that will also be joining us for the session today. The pandemic, it has really affected a lot of issues, especially regarding women's health, and we're not able to get proper OBGYN care. We also have many questions regarding COVID, menstrual health, PCOD, breast care, pregnancy, fertility, hormones, vaccinations, and so much more. So we decided that in this session, Dr. Mahita will answer all your questions related to women's health. She's a gynecologist and has an experience of over 24 years in high risk obstetrics and laparoscopic surgery. She practices at Apollo Cradle in Jubilee Hills in Hyderabad. She completed her MBBS from Osmania Medical College and from Gandhi Medical College, Hyderabad and the DGO from Dr. NTR University in Health Sciences in Andhra Pradesh in 1991. She's got many, many winning papers in national and international conferences. So we're very, very excited to have her with us. So Dr. Mahita, a very, very warm welcome to Sipping Thoughts. Uh, good evening, good evening, everybody. Love to join you all. So, uh, Doctor, we'll just get right into it. You know, one of the big questions I think everybody is struggling with is still with COVID and any updates about women's health and COVID, any precautions, anything that we should be thinking about? Yeah. Um, starting with the COVID, I know this is the hot topic for this year. Probably is going to continue for another couple of years. So we have to go with try to live with it, learn how to do with it. And the problems, most of the problems, gynae problems, what we are facing are, are stress-induced. Stress-induced resulting in the alteration in the hormonal milieu and abnormal bleeding disorders. And post-COVID, because of the steroids which are given to these women, it alters the internal hormones and resulting in alteration of the cycle. But COVID per se doesn't affect our internal organs so much. And pregnancy is a big issue. Till recently, till 25th of the last month, we weren't sure whether we can give COVID vaccination and pregnancy. But after that, the GOI has come and ordered for vaccination and pregnancy. So we are allowing women to conceive and go with pregnancy in COVID time too. That's so that, 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 that has been something I think as, new, that everyone has been waiting for with pregnant women and especially with the vaccination and whether they can take it or not. But doctor, I want to ask you, I mean, now you've been in the field, what are some of the main issues that you're seeing women come to you about? In COVID time, otherwise. COVID. Just generally both in non-COVID yeah. and COVID times. Yeah. Generally, most of the women, they come with issues like menstrual disorders. Menstrual disorders are the most evident one, which are manifestation of the internal diseases. So these can be like simple irregular cycles. Most of them are irregular cycles, or heavy bleeding, starting from the age of young adolescents with irregular heavy bleeding or infrequent cycles, probably most common cause being polycystic ovarian syndrome, which you know about, which we evaluate in the youngsters in the beginning, try to rule out those and later reproductive age group. We are worried about the irregular cycles because of and ovulation where they're not conceiving, infertility, that is infertility will be a major issue in 20 to 40 age group where they come with these infertility issues. And coming to the later age group beyond 40, they come with irregular cycles. Mostly these irregular 
T is because of the hormonal changes which take place within, evident as irregular or heavy breathing, which are managed in a different way compared to a young lady and a reproductive age woman. So before we go on, I want to uh, I want to ask you. I mean that you when are there any specific, especially because you're an expert in PCOS and PCOD. So I know you're going to talk a lot about that. You have really a lot of expertise. So I think we can get started with the session. Cystic ovaries are something really troublesome ones. Nowadays, it's evident in most of the young girls, especially in the school age and uh, early college, where we see the polycystic ovaries. What is polycystic ovarian disease as such? It's not confined to the ovary where you see in an ultrasound and say, oh, I've got polycystic ovarian disease. It's not only that polycystic ovary, ovaries which are of concern. Effects which are seen associated with polycystic ovarian disease, that is on the uterus resulting in irregular periods or on the metabolic effects of the entire body. The insulin resistance is high resulting in diabetes it affects the cardiovascular system, the renal system, and all the organs are affected because of the abnormal hormones within. So in polycystic ovaries, we first try to diagnose whether it is polycystic in a young adolescent girl. In young adolescent- When you say young adolescent girl, doctor, explain to us yeah. what is that age that you're talking about? And you know, so that we are aware as to when we should be starting to even think about it, because yeah. I think we hear this term everywhere, PCOD, PCOS. Yeah. I mean, every day that, you know, but somehow we think that, okay, does it happen to somebody else or can it happen to me also? Yeah. See, young adolescent, adolescence is divided into three phases, starting from 10 to 19. 10 to 13 is a very young, early adolescent where we are not worried about the irregularities and all that because the baby, the girl is not matured enough to think that she's got adolescent uh, polycystic ovaries. Then the middle order ones from 13, about 30 up to 16 is middle age group where middle adolescent Sometimes we have to diagnose polycystic ovaries if it's exaggerated with symptoms like, you know, too many pimples. That is exaggeration of a puberty. Normally, you know, at puberty, you have little small pimples and little hair growth. All the, and ultrasound also may have little ultra follicles, excessive follicles showing in that. But there we don't diagnose with the ultrasound finding, but based on the pimples and the hair growth. And the most important group coming to 17 to 19 is the group where we target them, try to diagnose at an early stage and prevent the consequences of this polycystic ovaries in them. Here, again, there can be an exaggeration of the puberty, but too much exaggeration, like lack of acne and excessive hair growth, you know, in that age group, Girls cannot withstand the abnormality of the hair growth, the pimples, and all the, the cosmetic purpose. At least for that, we have to investigate them with the total testosterone and other hormones in them, correct them at an early age so that this excessive hair growth and pimples can be managed with simple medication. Previously, we would talk about a lot of cosmetic procedures and all. But simple medication which we are giving to these young girls, we can cover the effects of this acne, hair citizen, that is excessive, unwanted hair growth on the body. Imagine a girl at that age having all these abnormal features, they feel so depressed, this fat girl sitting at home, doing nothing, and avoid going outside too. So at least for that purpose, encourage them, give them just the simple medication which controls, explain them about the lifestyle modification, cut down on the unwanted fatty food, the junk food, go out and start having a little more physical activity, exercise, yoga, aerobics, whatever they're interested in. 
little bit, at least 5% of weight loss will improve on their appearance, apart from the size, apart from the BMI, which you are talking about. It's appearance, the skin alters a lot with this exercise and the diet coming. Well, doctor, we'll get started with your, I know you have lots of questions people ask you, so you've put together what are the top questions you've been asked. So let's get started. And please, everyone, I know we get a lot of questions at the end. Please do start sharing your questions now because we line them up first come, first serve. So the quicker we get to your questions, we're most excited. But Dr. Mahita has also put together the 10 most frequently asked questions so that we can answer them first. We'll share these. It's not only polycystic ovaries, but I'll be discussing about the various issues. It's not just about... Nine. The most common, uh, Dr. Mahita, your slides are not sh shared yet. Yeah. Now you can see my slides. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, these are the few slides which I didn't put all the theory matter as such or the pictures, but the issues which I want to discuss in general, the most common current menstrual, menstrual issues. These simple things which you have to remember about the menstrual issues, young and middle age, that is, the reproductive age group people who commonly have three main types. That is infrequent cycles. That is in a year, in 12 months, minimum 13 cycles we, we are supposed to get as a normal uh, ovulating woman. But even up to nine cycles a year is considered as normal and you don't have to get scared and go run to a gynae for this issue. So remember, minimum of nine cycles are needed to say it is okay. Then comes, apart from the frequency, it is the amount and the duration. Five to seven days or three to seven days is the normal range. Anything beyond seven days or if the flow is more, when when do you say it is more? How do you know it is more or less? It's basically with the amount of blood, that is number of pads you use, that you can calculate, or normal menstruating fluid is not clotted. When the menstrual blood is clotted, then it is considered as a excessive bleeding. This is the sim single most con uh, feature where you can say, oh, you have excessive bleeding. Of course, anemia is another issue which you're worried, which we can control. So duration, the amount, and the frequency. These are three issues in menstrual abnormalities. So, Dr. Mahita, we're yeah. also getting a question. If you know that your periods are irregular, does it affect your health? And do you have to do something immediately as you notice this problem? Yeah, that's what I'm coming to. Like, if you have nine cycles in a year, you're not worried. But how infrequent are the cycles or how heavy they are, depending on. So if the cycles are too abnormal, less than nine cycles a year, or a heavy bleeding is there, then it's going to affect your health system in general. It's because of the abnormal hormones within us. At that situation, less than nine, or heavy bleeding, you have to consult a gynae. Otherwise, just up to this stage, it's fine. You don't have to consult immediately, especially in this COVID time. This is such a condition where you're scared whether to go consult immediately or can you wait for some more time till the COVID comes down. So these are the criteria you have to consider and go for a consultation if it's too abnormal beyond this. 
So, doctor, we are getting another question from Shweta. Like, because of the heavy bleeding, it's very hard to judge. How many pads should you be really using on a daily basis if it's normal bleeding? Yeah. See, it depends upon the cleanliness of a woman. See, if you change their pads every two hours, few four to six hours, and few of them, they just keep the pad the whole day. It's not about the number of pads. It's the how pad which is soaked. If a completely soaked pad is about three to four pads in a day is found, then you consider this as excessive. Another criteria to know whether this is excessive is the menstrual blood clots. If you see a clot in your period, then you consider it as high. It's excessive abnormal. I think you got it, right? Because people are not only using the pads, it's the menstrual cups which are available, tampons, and tampons calculation, and the pads are again different. So about three pads, moderately soaked, is normal. You don't worry about that. So, but the normal change in pads, minimum four to every four to six hours, you have to change your pads. That's important to avoid any infections and rashes. I think you got it? Yes. Anything related to menstrual issues? We are getting lots, but I think about menstrual cups and we'll take that all in the Q&A. Okay. okay, yeah. Menstrual cups are another, the most upcoming ones which we are trying to advocate because uh, the problems which we are facing with the menstrual pads will come down totally, hopefully with this. So are you aware of the menstrual hygiene? This is what exactly I want was coming to. The hygiene, how frequently you're supposed to change your pads. What pads, is it the pad, the tampon, or the menstrual cup, which is advocated? And what type of pads do you want to use? Is it the disposable ones which you are uh, getting uh, over the counter? Are the cotton ones, the reusable ones? which we are advocating a lot of, which you're seeing in the movies too. And, and most important one, which what I want to mention about is disposable, disposing of these menstrual pads has become a very big issue. So in few schools and colleges, what we are trying to do is put a dispenser over there, dispenser and an incinerator, dispenser of the pads, an incinerator where it, it disposes of the used pad. So these are very important. We are advocating in all the schools all over the state over here. So that it covers most of the hygiene part in schools, especially in the government set up schools, we are trying to put them on. Okay, and menstrual, menstrual cup is another important one where we can insert it into the vagina, simple ones, which need no autoclaving and all that. Simple washing of these cups is enough. And on one cycle, you can just each day use it, wash it and reuse it. Whereas after one for next cycle, they can be just boiled in hot water and can be used again. So these are simple ones. They're not too expensive as you uh, think of because it, it is a reusable one, healthy one, and don't spend too much on these disposable pads. Any other menstrual hygiene things that we should be actually following? Yeah. The menstrual hygiene, that is changing of pads is one and cleaning of the external genitalia normally. Like you, uh, soaps are used, most of them think cleaning with the soap is a very hygienic condition. Whether it's the external genitalia or internally, soap should not be used. It alters the pH of the vagina and the external genitalia and uh, allows the other organisms to grow in. So, 
use a solution that is empty wash and all these solutions, alkaline solutions are available, which can be used vaginally or on the external genitalia. And one more most important thing, which people shy away about talking these things, but washing after uh, using the washroom is not from back to front, but from above downwards. It has to be used. The cleaning always should be, whether you use a tissue or water, it has to be from above downwards so that the vaginal area is not soiled. So that's an important thing. And most of them think after each uh, urination, you have to wa use water. More than the water is the dry padding, the tissue you use, keep that area dry so that the infections, the fungal infections don't come in. So don't shy away about talking in these things. So use tissues most of the time, keep it dry. And if you're washing or tissueing, from above downwards, from the urine part backwards, and it doesn't get infected above after uh, using the washroom. So I think these are the factors, the washing, cleaning, and empty wash, whatever wash which is available, we wash, most of them find it over the counter, can be used in this external area or the internal area. It doesn't alter the pH and prevents other secondary infections. Anything else? I think those we'll take in the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, just one question, maybe menstrual cups are they advisable also for younger, for like seventeen-year-olds, or should they be done later? Uh, it can be used for young girls too. If you can explain them properly, these are moldable ones. See, many go for tampon usage where the hymen gets a little disturbed. The same way here, if, it's more, you, if you can mold it and insert it properly, it doesn't hurt the young girls too. It can be used. We are advocating that. For Thank them. you. I particularly want to stress upon this menstrual cups, especially, you know, when people wear tight pants and, you know, the clothing where they're not comfortable using, when they have excessive bleeding, they can't use you know, two or three pads and seen externally. It's all, you know, ugly things. But menstrual cup, you can avoid such a scenario. And it's comfortable for young girls too. Unmarried, I mean. So let's go on to the next topic. We can take the questions later, right? Yes, we will. So now coming to the hot topic of COVID-19. Though we discussed a few issues in it, this is a major problem. Gynec issues, people, one thing is having a gynec issue in the COVID time and to know whether with that gynec issue, do they have to consult really or virtual is also enough. These are the queries, a lot of queries which we are getting at nowadays. When we are going for a virtual consultation, keep, uh, people keep coming online and asking, oh, this is the issue. Do I have to be worried? Do I have to get the procedure immediately? Do I have to use any medication at this time? These are the queries which we get virtually on a virtual online basis. But as I discussed, COVID per se doesn't cause a lot of gyne problems. It is the stress of COVID which alters a hormonal milieu internally and disturbs the cycle. It, the cycle may get irregular, but not too abnormal, which we need worry. Another infertility issues too. Previously, last year, most of first six months of COVID, we said no, no infertility, no elective procedures and all that. But how long do we wait for this? We try to learn to live with COVID. That's an easier way. Infertility issues, abnormal bleeding issues can be tackled 
uh, initially online, then go for a real consultation and infertility treatments, getting all precautions, going ahead with the infertility treatment and not facing any issue as far as the uh, irregularity of the cycle or the endometrial tissue abnormalities are not found much with these COVID infections. So you can go ahead with the pregnancy, conceive, and suppose you haven't taken the vaccination, you can take the vaccination in pregnancy after first three months as a recent guidelines have come that you can take vaccination in India in our, with our own vaccinations, which are available. Last year, other countries, Western European countries have started giving vaccination, but in India, it has come recently, as recent as 25th of last month. And so confidently we can give the vaccination to the pregnant woman after the third month. And after delivery, you can give, there's no contraindication, baby is not going to be affected with the vaccination. So if you want to plan pregnancy, you take the vaccination, give a gap of three months and conceive. If you don't want to wait, conceive after third month, go ahead with the vaccination. That's, that's the procedure which we are following now. Doctor, one question has come up and we see this all over a lot of blogs that because of COVID, two issues are popping up. One is that people are saying that their menstrual cycles are irregular and that it is affecting more women that have PCOD. Can you give some uh, light on that? Yeah, most of these issues are not because of the COVID infection per se, but the stress, stress of COVID is one issue where the internal hormones are altered. Another issue is steroids. When people are affected with COVID, these steroid uh, tablets are given, high doses are given, which alters the hormonal milieu again. These can affect the menstrual cycles. But COVID per se doesn't affect the uterus or anything. It is the stress, it is the steroids which is causing the alteration in the hormonal milieu, resulting in the alteration of cycles. And does this go back to normal? I mean, the hormonal issues that some women are seeing? Yeah, apart from the irregular cycles, uh, but endometrium is not infected. Well, few studies only are available till now. So not a uh, lot of abnormalities and all are not found. They're found because of the steroid stress of COVID, not because of the disease per se. These abnormal and infertility issues are also not seen in them. In, for, in fact, most of them are conceiving in the COVID time. Probably, like, you know, work from home issues and, you know, and other things. And vaccination, all of us should take vaccination. It doesn't affect the body or the fertility. It's, it's not going to, inter the vaccination will not affect our genital organs, internal organs, or our fertility issues at all. So go ahead with the vaccination and conceive. Then any questions on COVID with gynec problems? One question has come up. I mean, and we see this anecdotally, but uh, Nidhi is also saying her daughter's period came 10 days early after her first COVID vaccination. Is that normal? Uh, COVID vaccination, no. 10 days early could be because of the stress or probably after vaccination, they'll have slight temperature fever, which may alter the internal system. But vaccination per se doesn't affect the cycles. It's not a live vaccine too. You know, all these COVID vaccines, whatever, Covishield, Covaxin, all these are not live vaccines. So cycle disturbance is not vaccine per se, but because of the associated fever, stress, and all these things. That's it. Thank you for clarifying that. Because people are scared. See, they take vaccination, have some fever for short period, you know, any vaccine, uh, we don't give TT 
injection to a simple TT, which we are talking about in a pregnancy, and they'll have pain for a couple of days too. So we don't stop from giving that vaccine, right? The same way, COVID, it protects the women. These women are so badly affected, more than the non-pregnant women. The pregnant women are prone for complications in COVID. So vaccination prevents, reduces these complications and allows them to survive. It goes away with a minimal symptoms and they recover quickly, even if they get COVID after vaccination. So I do advise vaccination for all these women. I've seen several cases where in COVID with pregnancy, they have a lot of complications. It's so tough to handle them once they get severe fever because the immune system is altered in pregnancy. So they may have exaggerated symptoms affecting the health of the woman and the baby too. Though it's not transmitted from the placenta. The placental transmission is not there. It's not seen till now. COVID is not transmitted from the mother to the baby. Vertical transmission is not there. But because of the toxin release, it may damage the fetus. The fetal growth restrictions and sudden IUDs are seen with COVID in pregnancy. So let's try to avoid it or minimize it with vaccine. Let's go on to other topics. Anything? Now let's let's go to the next topic because I think we have quite a lot to cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> now these are the issues. Now we're done with menstrual problems, the COVID-related, all these. Now let's move on to the preventive aspect of various conditions. What are the preventive conditions which are under our control? These are starting with the most common cancers in our country is cervical cancer. Cervical cancer, a lot of studies are going on. WHO is coming with various protocols. Recently, as recent 2020, 20 protocols also have come. Initially, every year they would do a pap smear. Then came the HPV testing. You know, HPV vaccine, which is available for prevention of cervical cancer. What is that vaccine? You want to know? It's a vaccine which protects you against the human papilloma virus, which is the causative one for survive, causing cervical cancer. So let's take the vaccine from the age of nine to 35 we are giving. It prevents the HPV infection, hence the cervical cancer. This vaccination, Gardasil survey, a lot of other vaccine trade names are there, but this is a HPV vaccination. It, if it is given from the pre marital stage before they are sexually active, it prevents the infection much better than when they are exposed. So start giving from the age of nine. This has moved from the reproductive age group to even the pediatric age group that is from nine years onwards to 35, we are covering them with the vaccination. Three doses of vaccine we give and it protects them against the HPV infection and the cervical cancer. So doctor, there's still some confusion on this. Should, is this mandatory? Should this be done? Be, or is this optional? The See, cervical? Yeah, we didn't make it as uh, like any other vaccine. It didn't come in the schedule as such. Few pediatricians have included in their schedule too. If you give it, you make it a mandatory thing in a young girl. So that, that age group, if we cover, that age group, if we target, the parents will be ready to give the vaccination. And there's one misnomer which people think in India, people are not so promiscuous. We are not going to get HPV infection. You know, I have my own friends too who talked about this saying, oh, Americans, they're Europeans. For them, you need. Why an Indian girl needs? No, don't go with the wrong notion that Indian girls don't need. And don't think they're not promiscuous all in different situations. So we are not going to talk about that promiscuity. It's not that alone. It is about the HPV infection in a married woman. 
in a sexually active woman. So all of us, where the cervical cancer is so high in our country, please give the vaccination to prevent the HPV. What do you do if, uh, what can be done in this aspect if you're over 36? Uh, 36, uh, of course, vaccination is one, nine to 35. After 35, we don't give vaccine, but we keep testing for HPV. HPV testing is now available. And the screening before previously, we would talk about only pap smear. Most of us know about what pap smear is. It's from the simple pap technique to liquid based cytology has come and then this technology has improved. And now people are going for colposcopy too for training and preventing cervical cancers. But HPV testing is the one, if you do HPV testing from age of 25 to 20, 65 years, this testing can be done every five years. If it is negative, repeat after five years. HPV testing, simple. Or HPV with pap smear together can be done. Same sitting, you can take a smear from the cervix, a pap smear and a HPV test and send it for testing. If they are negative for another five years, you may have to repeat the test. Every five years you do this. If only pap smear is done from 25 to 60. Why you have to do it every three years. But in our Indian setup, at least like one pap smear if somebody can do with the HPV test, that will be a remarkable one. We can cut down cancers so much. Now, doctor, you, you did mention this, but how often should we get a pap smear done? Or is it only every three years is good enough? Every three years is good enough. That's and at what age should we start getting a pap smear? From the age previously, we would say 20. Now it's 25 years. That is, up, once they become sexually active, after sexually active, 25 years to 65 years, we do a pap smear every three years. But in Indian setting, we are advising at least opportunistic pap smear. You know, what is opportunistic pap smear? People don't come for pap smear. You know, people, women think, they shouldn't, they need bother about their health so much. They're concerned about the entire family, but about themselves, very few think about. So when they come for the menstrual problem or white discharge or some issues, at that time, you take a pap smear. White discharge is one common thing which people come with because they're scared it can be because of the cancer. So that opportunistic screening, you take a pap smear once they come for a white discharge or the menstrual abnormal. So, so please do talk a little bit more about the white discharge because it's such a such a common problem that we do see. Yeah. See, one thing, people don't understand that white discharge, little bit of slimy discharge, egg white, egg white type of discharge is a common discharge, which is because of the hormonal changes in the body. It may occur during ovulation or premenstrual. If during ovulation, there'll be a lot of Egg white discharge. That's a normal one. It encourages, the, it uh, helps in the uh, sexual act, intercourse problem will be there. And uh, it's a normal phenomenon. People think it's abnormal and it's not knowing that it's a normal physiological one. And coming to the pathological, how do you differentiate this egg, egg white slimy discharge from an abnormal one? The abnormal ones are generally foul smelling or curdy, thick discharge or a yellowish discharge. These are the variants where you need to be worried, think that it's an abnormal white discharge and go ahead with the uh, radiation and treatment for such abnormalities. Just for slimy discharge, not thick, not foul smelling, don't be worried about. Uh, Didi is asking a question. Pathological Differences we should know. So white discharge should happens every day or two to three times a day. Should that be worry? Uh, see, two to three times in during ovulation is also normal. It's not two to three times. It, they'll have a continuous discharge at the time of ovulation. It's a normal physiological phenomenon. So at that time they may have little excess. So didn't worry about it. Two to three times, it's not the times 
uh, the discharge. It's a continuous process. The cervical glands are there. It's a normal gland glandular structure, which has a lot of secretions which come out at the time of ovulation on the uterus and the cervix. So, I, so I think another question, maybe you can explain that again. Is normal discharge watery or thickish? And what's the difference between normal discharge and abnormal discharge? Yeah, that's what I think you didn't get me. Yeah. Explained about, it's not just watery. Watery is where it's not watery, it's slimy, egg, egg white. If you see an egg, and just cut an egg and see, the white part of the egg is slimy. It's colorless mostly but not exactly watery. So that slimy discharge is a normal discharge. Whereas abnormal discharge is curd, curd like thick curd, where it can be because of the fungal infections or yellowish thick. The color is altered, the thickness is altered. That is abnormal again. So that's how you differentiate between a normal physiological discharge and a pathological one. Thank you. Am I clear? Yes. Whoever asked the question, yeah. So, about the white discharges, this is the one, and we go for any pap smear abnormality. Nowadays, we are going for a colposcopic examination. That is a magnified view of the cervix. If there's any abnormality, we'll try to further take a biopsy sample. Otherwise, simple, these type of discharges with simple medication can be treated. And some are manifestation of even sexually transmitted disease, which you got to be aware of. So such things with some infections, the discharge may come. You have to differentiate between a normal simple infections and sexually transmitted diseases. Right? Right. So should we go ahead with another preventable cancers? All this time we were talking about cervical cancers and the pap smears, which are most commonly done. And at least these are feasible for us. But coming to a mammogram, if we advise a mammogram to a woman, very, very few. With my statistics, what I've seen, especially in a menopausal woman, when they come to us with various problems, when we advise mammogram, first that hesitancy is seen in them. So cervical cancer, at least they'll follow. But mammogram, just about 20%, 20 to 25% of people will get a mammogram done. The mammogram is nothing but a simple X-ray taken over the breast. And this will give us the, any abnormality. And that, by start, uh, guidelines, we start from 50 years above. And in high risk group, high risk in the sense, suppose a mo mother had breast cancer or family history of any other cancers are there. And such, and the woman is obese, a lot of hormonal imbalance. In such women, we do it little early, 45 years only. This is about mammogram, and there are different techniques of mammogram. A simple X-ray may be there, a digital mammogram may be there, and the new one which is coming where the X-rays are all put together in a digital form and single and tested the latest one, which gives a lot of information about any small growth in the breast. This is about the clean, general investigation. But coming to the self, simple techniques, you know, Rest is another organ which we have to take care, make sure we are not missing any tumors, muscles, and all these. So there are two things. One is self breast examination, and another one is a clinical breast examination. Self breast examination is a be uh, make the woman do examine their own breast in a proper technique. It after their bath, they can just see and examine, and it should be held in between fingers, but examination should be with the fingers on the palmar side. Examine this way, putting your hand fingers on the breast and in a circular manner, examine the breast. That is self-breast examination, which can be done quite 
frequently, once a month or so. And if you have a doubt, then you can go for a clinical breast examination. But in young women, we don't advise a mammogram before 40 years. There's no point because dense breast doesn't show any abnormality so clearly. Clinical breast examination is nothing but the same self breast examination, which is done by the woman, will be examined properly by an expert, that is a gynecologist or an oncologist or a general surgeon can examine clinically the bilateral breast and the axilla for any lymph nodes. That is clinical breast examination, which, is the, which can be done yearly in a yearly check. That's enough. Is it, I, I think a lot of people are afraid of mammograms because they think they're painful also. Can you yeah. shed some light on that? Yeah, of course. This typical x-ray mammogram. Mammogram, the different techniques which I talked about, but the one which they keep an x-ray over the breast and slightly put a pressure on it. And it may be painful that for a few seconds when we take the x-ray. That is routine mammogram. But now we got the digital mammogram where it is seen online digitally and the newer ones are coming. All those don't need much pressure. They don't use so much pressure. And it doesn't harm the breast. It doesn't cause damage, no internal bleed or any abnormality developing after the mammogram. You don't have to get scared. It's only scary because it's slightly painful. But see, belvedis are a little painful. Are we not going ahead when having our babies normally too? Though nowadays we are giving epidural anesthesia and analgesia and all. No? So mammogram, if you compare that way, mammogram is a very simple one. Mild pressure is given, which may hurt few seconds. That's it. It's not harmful at all. So that's about the breast, the care of the breast. And the most important one, one point which I want to mention over here is that uh, the brass support which these people use in young ones with heavy breasts especially, it should be uh, worn in a correct size and underwire brass will damage. Like if they're used for a long time, they may hurt the breast tissue and cause certain problems in these women. So they have to be changed uh, more frequently. They have to be washed more frequently. And any damage, underwire protrusion, and all these have to be correct, thrown away. Those brass should be thrown away. So take care of those small ones. So please do talk a little bit more about bras because I think there's a lot of confusion about that and what kind of bras, who needs to wear a bra and can you wear a bra 24 hours a day? You know, when, yeah. Yeah? yeah. So if you can give some guidance on that. Yeah, two, two tight bras and underwire, which I was talking about, cannot be worn for a long period. And overnight should not be worn. But even if you're wearing, it should be a, you know, comfort fitting cotton ones. No, uh, and if there's too much sweating and all, fungal infections develop underneath the breast. If they're not wearing the whole day too is an issue again. Heavy breasts, not wearing proper supports will have its own implications. And a lot of sweat collecting below the heavy breast causes heavy fungal infections which are difficult to manage again. So, and overnight, you can't have these heavy bras. At the most, support cotton bras can be worn, but not tight-fitting ones at, in the night. And, these, and is, are bras necessary or mandatory to maintain breast tissue, or can one be bra-free? Yeah. See, bra-free, nowadays, a lot of people are talking Western world, you're saying they're avoiding them and all that. But see, two tight ones can be avoided. But if the heavy breast is there, you need a support. So such people have to wear a bra. So without support, they'll have other back issues and all. That's a big issue too. 
That but means, it's not needed to maintain the breast tissue. Is it needed to maintain the breast no, tissue? Not maintaining the breast tissue, just to support it. That's it. And postpartum. Postpartum, the type of bra which you are supposed to wear uh, should be like support. There, the supporting bras are very, very important. They're heavy, they'll be feeding, and you know, you can't just leave them like that. You have to have a support brass postpartum when you're feeding. Yeah, of course, cosmetically sagging and all can be avoided if you wear these brass in the postpartum period. Okay, so let's go on to the another preventive aspect, the prevention of the cervical cancer, breast cancer, and all we talked about. But Prevention of an unwanted pregnancy is a major, major issue. Most of them, you know, they come back to us saying that they didn't plan this pregnancy and by in, uh, mistake they uh, didn't use a contraceptive and they're pregnant now and they come for termination. It's a worst scenario. If you are not planning pregnancy, okay, you're not using any contraceptive, and you had a sexual intercourse, not using any contraceptive, still after that, within 72 hours, please take a pill, which is available. Nowadays, they are supplying over the counter to the eye pill or pill 72, all these which are available. These are nothing but simple high progesterone pills which are available if it is taken after the act within 72 hours, as early as possible, or at least 72 day hours, that is three days after the sexual intercourse, if you take the pill, it prevents the ovulation. Ovulation is delayed, but it, that acts only for that act. Again, after a couple of days later, if you uh, are not using a contraceptive or a damage of the condom, you still have to reuse the pill with a gap if you're having a sexual intercourse without any contraception. So this is a short acting one. Few people use it as on a regular basis, especially those who meet their husbands uh, rarely, like twice or thrice a month or so, and they don't want to use the contraceptive pills the whole month. For such people, they can use it for two, two times or three times occasionally, but not as a regular contraceptive throughout. I've seen people who use these pills years together, using them as a contraceptive. There you're using high dose. It alters your cycle. It produces delayed cycle, irregular cycle, irregular spotting. So don't use it on a long term, but short term, yes, please go ahead with this pill when you have an accidental sexual intercourse. Out of marriage, out of unprotected, whatever it is, you can have this pill, use it, available over the counter, government made it available, it is given freely over the counter. Now, oh, we are talking about the pregnancy alone with an unprotected intercourse. It's not just the pregnancy which we are worried about. We are worried about the sexually transmitted disease. I don't know how many of you all are aware of the sexually transmitted diseases. Here, uh, unprotected intercourse, out of marriage intercourse, but with, with various partners may result in sexually transmitted disease. So beware. Again, another one which is available over the counter are condoms. A main partner refusing to use condoms in such a scenario, even female condoms are available. Of course, they have to get trained using female condoms, but still try learn it and protect yourselves from the sexually transmitted disease. Either male condom or 
female condoms. Because these sexually transmitted diseases are so troublesome if you're not going to prevent them or treat them at a very early stage, if they are going to affect your fertility, your internal organs, your pelvic abscesses are forming, permanent damage to the tissues take place and chronic pelvic pain, and like they cannot be treated at the very late stage, resulting in infertility. And this infection can transmit to the baby too if they're not treated in the early stage. Now, and one question, like yeah. does one need to use a pill if condom is also used? No, uh, see, condom protection is not 99% protection for contraception as a contraceptive pill, but it protects more than 90, 95%. So for that small percentage, if you really want to be careful, then use a pill, an emergency pill. Suppose there's a condom breakage, and if it's torn, leakage is there, and that situation, you have to use a emergency pill, eye pill, pill 72, which are available. So that's important again, but they can be used for sexually trans protection of sexually transmitted disease and for contraception, both. And we'll discuss about the sex and sexuality. I don't think we have much time. Of course, a few things which we I want to project over here, like how many, how many people are ready to discuss these things? I don't know. I don't think they can come up with, with difficulty in chitis, painful chitis, inability to do it, are the small issues which they don't come up with. But these issues can be solved by simple measures. And when, they when they're dry, think about some hormonal imbalance. They can do Gels can be given in the initial stages and people who are tensed or are having a rigid hymen or rigid perineum can have difficulty in sexual intercourse. Such issues can be dealt with simple measures. Don't hesitate to come up and tell your problems. These are important issues and don't suppress yourself leading to a lot of uh, internal problems among the family. So these are issues which you know, small things can be corrected, can be treated and simple surgeries also can help you out in long way. PCOs, when do you approach a gynae? What we discussed about in the initial stage, what are the things? Simple things, acne, hirsutism, clarity, and obesity. Obesity, having insulin resistance, and many of these kids have pigmentation over their neck. And this is an indication that it's hyperinsulin. Insulin resistance is there in them. Polycystic ovaries are there, especially young girls, when to treat, when not to treat, which we were discussing about. These are the issues. When they are associated with all this, you have to treat them early. It is easier in the initial stages. Pills are available which treat the uh, insulin resistance and the cycles are corrected. Acne, that is pimples and hair distribution, all these are corrected with simple pills which are available. People, the dermatologists think we are competing with them and just treating all these issues with simple, simple contraceptive pills which are available over the counter. So please don't hesitate if the irregular cycles are associated with various cosmetic issues. Obesity, obesity issue is the one which we have to deal with. Doctor, one question, the weight loss and weight issue with PCOS. How does one deal with that? Kirti is also asking that question. Yeah. Weight Any lifestyle tips also? Lifestyle modifications are very important. This slide I just kept to show you people that, you know, uh, what are the various issues which cause polycystic ovaries? It's not ovaries having follicles 
peripherally arranged. It's not that alone. It's because of the alteration in the metabolism, the neuroendocrine system is affected, and environmental factors are is causing this polycystic ovaries nowadays. The, and the epigenetics, I don't have time to discuss about it, but remember the environment is changing the epigenetics methylation of the microRNA and resulting in polycystic ovaries. So beware of the environment. Try to modify your environment, modify the changes in your lifestyle and try to avoid this epigenetics changes and polycystic ovaries. So these lifestyle modifications, which are very important in our day-to-day -day life. That is lifestyle modification, either exercises. For young girls, you can ask them to go to a gym and minimum 10,000 steps. All of you know, you we really have to at any age, be from adolescence to perimenopausal for PCO. It is 10,000 steps which are important. Walk, brisk walking is one major thing which you have to advise for all age groups and younger age groups, ask them to go for not only brisk walk, running, aerobics and gym exercises are important to con because it not only reduces your weight, the weight reduction will improve your insulin resistance which is a bad factor in the polycystic ovaries. That insulin resistance will come down correct the internal system, help you out in controlling the weight, controlling your insulin resistance, preventing from developing diabetes, preventing the polycystic ovaries. So please, all you youngsters, go in for lifestyle modifications. That is, come out of your books, on table, laptops, cell phones, and go out in the open air. Of course, this COVID is preventing you, but a lot of spaces are available in, uh, at least our Hyderabad, we have a lot of open air spaces. Go for walking, jogging, and all these. And uh, gym at home, we are advising. Exercises and yoga and meditation. A lot of online classes are available now. Yoga will control the stress of polycystic, control the stress of COVID, control the stress of their appearance. They start believing in themselves, admiring themselves if they're going for this yoga and meditation, which will bring down the stress levels and improve on the general health of the women. Of course, acupuncture and all these also help, but yoga, meditation, exercises are the most important ones. And another important one is the diet. Avoid junk food. The COVID, at least what I've noticed in COVID time is a lot of people have learned different cooking methods, healthy cooking habits, less oil, more steam cook, pan fry. The change in the cooking style help you out. And a lot of people started cooking at home because they're scared to take anything from outside. So they started all these at home. Healthy cooking, reduce on fats, will help you out at long way. And have multicolored. Try to find as many colors of vegetables in your diet as possible. Minimum, we say, three colors of vegetables in your diet every day. And a lot of fruits. Though mangoes are heavy calories, still they help you out in control of sugars and weight too. So diet and lifestyle modification, healthy living are important ones which we explain these young girls to improvise their weight, improvise their clinical features, improvise their general appearance and don't confine themselves at home, being stressed out to show their faces with bad appearances. No, start loving yourself, counsel them that way and send them out for exercises and they start improving in no time. That's my concept of managing this young and the productive age group women with polycystic ovaries. I hope in future with this COVID which taught us so many things in our life can improvise our lifestyle.
that's the concept of holistic always. Anything, any doubts about these lifestyle changes? What we talk about in polycystic ovaries is the area above this umbilical level, above waist size and below waist. Above waist, that is upper waist obesity is polycystic obesity, androgenic obesity, unwanted obesity, bad fat. That gives you an apple size appearance. Whereas the right one, the other pear-shaped body is a woman shape. That is, above umbilicus fat is not seen. And we try to convert these polycystic ovary people from apple to a pear. That's the concept. Okay, once these are improved, automatically hormonal changes. Everything within the body, mind changes. So this is about polycystic ovaries, weight changes, menstrual disorders, everything will be corrected in this scenario. Anything, any more queries which I can talk about? And most of them, they don't visit a gynae in their lifetime. They say around menopause age, they come to us and say, this is the first time I'm coming to a gynae for a checkup <laughs> with their regular cycles or menopausal symptoms. I don't want that to happen. Start planning from your young teenage age group. It's not for consultation I'm talking about. It's for your lifestyle management. Just any minor changes, make sure it is not normal, normal menstrual cycle, pre-pregnant evaluation, to menopausal evaluation, all these things, you just evaluate yourself from a simple outpatient department. Okay? So most of you, if I can ask you, how many have visited your gynae in this COVID time? With, even with multiple problems, I think you were scared to go. But I think most of these queries are cleared. What are the issues? What are the abnormal ones where you have to consult? The normal ones you can stay at home. And what are the abnormal pathologies? What are the preventive measures which we can follow and have a healthy life without any untoward effect, either of the menstrual due to menstrual abnormalities or cancers or sexually transmitted diseases? If you can justify in this short time most of the conditions, I think these are followed. We can have a healthy woman's life. And of course, menopause I'm not going to talk about now. It takes another one hour minimum to have a healthy lifestyle in menopausal age, which we are trying to get that postmenopausal age to a young as equivalent to a reproductive age group woman. They should live in that comfort level. This is about my talk. Any queries and they do answer. Dr. Them. Mahita, thank you. You covered so many issues. I think a couple of questions we'll try to quickly take. Swati is asking, is spotting normal in PCOD? Is spotting? Yeah. yeah. Spotting occurs in uh, PCO, but how abnormal is it? Spotting during ovulation is a normal issue, whether with PCO or not. But only spotting without normal bleeding, it shows there's some abnormality, menstrual abnormality, hormonal abnormality. That has to be evaluated. Just spotting without regular periods is not a normal issue. Lot of them, lot of these people have spotting. But only spotting, intermenstrual spotting at the time of ovulation and having a regular cycles is not a real bad feature. So, Dr. Rekha is asking, why most women suffer from irregular periods at the age of around 42 onwards and how to overcome it naturally? Yeah. See, oh, 42 is a little early for a menopause, but menopause starts three to five years before the actual menopause. Menopausal changes takes place, a lot of hormonal issue the ovulation will come down. This anovulatory cycle, three to five years before your actual menopause. And because of that, the, 
irregular cycles happen and they may have excessive bleeding, prolonged bleeding or prolonged period of amenorrhea that is no cycle and having a cycle after two months, three months. These are the issues which are commonly seen around 42. These are called perimenopausal issues. And India, you know, it is 46.2 years, which we consider it as average age of menopause. Slightly right. in the Western world, that's the issue with us. So how to cope up with is another major thing. See, nowadays we have a lot of evaluation done for these age group women. And if the symptoms are very severe, we give them hormonal therapy. Otherwise, lifestyle changes. Again, the exercises, weight control, weight control, and a lot of iso, isoflavones, which soy protein, which we give these people. Uh, and rather than giving them directly estrogens for all of them, estrogens we can give if the symptoms are really high and they don't have other complications, we evaluate all the systems. You know, it's not about the menstrual bleeding, it's about the cardiovascular system and all these lipid profile. We have to check in these women and then go for hormonal therapy. Otherwise, lifestyle modifications and soya protein, all these high protein things, which given a little bit of estrogen will control the symptoms for short period. If they don't, then we have to do a detailed evaluation and give them hormones. So Nidhi is asking that I have observed that before I feel like peeing, I sometimes have a watery discharge. Is that normal? No. Just to, uh, before every act, it's not a normal thing. Definitely it doesn't happen like that. Not, probably around ovulation, you may have little discharge, but not watery again. It's a slimy discharge, as I told you. So you have to check for what you discharge, maybe some urinary small uh, opening somewhere and that may be dribbling from the uh, urinary tract. Shusha is asking that she's 36 and is planning for her first pregnancy. What precautions should she take to have a healthy baby? And what tests should she get before getting pregnant? Yeah, excellent. Actually, I didn't have time to cover that. That last slide was about the pre-pregnancy evaluation. It's not about uh, Nidhiya, whoever is asking. It's not about her at 36. It's also when a woman is planning to conceive early, even before 30, they should have a pre-pregnancy evaluation. That is basic diabetic evaluation, which we we do, and a thyroid evaluation, and viral markers we do. Exclude even rubella antibodies, whether they are there or not, and give them vaccination if the IgG antibodies are not there in them. And once these basic things are corrected, even vi vitamin D level is considered as a pre-pregnant evaluation, even that is corrected, and we allow them to plan their pregnancy. Of course, since she's 36, she's asking in terms of any genetic abnormalities if they have. We don't do any genetic evaluation as such in these women, even at 36. But after conceiving, we do certain tests. In that, we'll know whether there's any abnormality in the baby. Okay. Of course, after 35, risk is slightly increased for fetal anomalies. And we give only folic acid. Once we correct the diabetes, thyroid, and uh, uh, any of these tests which are the abnormal, viral markers are abnormal, we treated, rubella is corrected, then we allow them to continue with just folic acid sedimentation. So uh, guys, I know we still have lots of questions and I apologize if we haven't been able to get, we'll definitely try to get Dr. Mahita back. She's an expert, expert, expert in menopause. And so I was just talking to her about that also. But like she says, like almost each of these topics takes almost an hour to cover. And we try to cover That's so right. much. Yeah. So It's very difficult to cover the entire thing in a single setting. So I try to cover the younger age group with menstrual disturbances and COVID related and vaccinations. These are things preventive aspect. Yes. So Dr. Mahita, any last closing words before we end our session for today? Yeah, starting from the young age, concentrate on your healthy lifestyle. 
maintain a good, nice BMI of 18 to 23. That's a normal BMI with a healthy diet and go for a preventive uh, examination, the investigations and maintain a healthy lifestyle without any complications in the future with either pregnancy or cervical cancer, or breast cancer or sexually transmitted disease we can protect ourselves from these. So I advise all of you to have a healthy, healthy lifestyle, even in this COVID time. Don't be too up hands and uh, most of them think they should come out for even major problems. You can come out, take medical advice and treat yourselves with these problems. Stay safe. Of course, now I'm not wearing my mask, but please, even after vaccination, have a mask and go out. I think you all can see a lot of marks on our faces with the <laughs> protective gear mask. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Mahita, and thank you all for joining us today on Sipping Thoughts. Thank you. Nice being interacting with y'all. <laughs>